group educational session. And thank you so much for joining us for this really important topic. And we're really sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, and today we actually have a much wider audience than we normally do because we have people outside of the WNG group that have joined us. So just to let you know, the WNG is an online community of more than 3,500 women, which provides support, advocacy, and education. And today we are having another session, excellent session on um, how to start conversations about diversity in neurology. Here is Dr. Amy Hessler, um, who will then interview our two panelists. Uh, Dr. Hessler is an associate professor of neurology at the University of Kentucky, and she's an active member of um, American Academy of Neurology. She's actually one of the founding members of uh, uh, moderators of WNG, and she's also part of the Joint Coordinating Council on Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, Disparities uh, within the AAN. So thank you, Dr. Hessler, for joining us, and I will uh, let you uh, take this here onwards. Hey, thank you so much, Monica. I appreciate it. So I am so pleased to introduce my two guests. So uh, Dr. Emma Ebong is an assistant professor of neurology and clinical neurophysiology at the University of Kentucky with me. Um, she's also the director of diversity and inclusion for the Department of Neurology. She received her bachelor's of science degree in biomedical engineering and master's of science degree in bioengineering from George, Georgia Tech in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and after working briefly for the government of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas as a technical officer in the Ministry of Health, she matriculated at the University of Kentucky College of Medicine in Lexington where she received her doctorate of medicine degree. She completed her residency in neurology and fellowship in clinical neurophysiology at Jackson Memorial Hospital in Miami, Florida. She's a diplomat of the ABPN uh, and board certified in both neurology and clinical neurophysiology. She's a founding member of the American Academy of Neurology underrepresented in neurology section, a, a brand new section. Um, she was selected to serve as a member of the AN Special Commission on Racism, Inequity, and Social Justice, and she's a graduate of the 2019 American Academy of Neurology Diversity Leadership Program and is a member of the AN Diversity Officers Work Group. So, so glad to have Dr. Ebong with us. And next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Egadero is a native of Kentucky where she graduated with honors and summa cum laude with a bachelor's of science in biology and minor in chemistry and French from the University of Kentucky. After graduation, she matriculated into a combined MD PhD program at UK um, where she was the first African-American female to complete the MD PhD program. And during her uh, training, she published over 15 articles in the area of hippocampal sclerosis of aging and cerebral um, small vessel disease and neurologic health disparities in African Americans. She's uh, received numerous awards for her activism work on the campus and within the community. Currently, she's a neurology resident of PGY2 and a neuroscientist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And after residency, she plans to matriculate into stroke or behavioral neurology fellowship. And her research interests focus on understanding the role of racism in neurologic health disparities and risk factors for cerebral small vessel disease. And then in her spare time uh, as a resident, <laughs> she mentors students at various training levels, an interest in medicine and neuroscience. And she's created educational videos related to neuroscience for the general public and she's active on YouTube and on Twitter and um, on Facebook as well. So just to get us started, what our goal of this conversation really was, and uh, Catherine uh, Lefevre, Dr. Lefevre was kind enough to ask us to do this, um, is to have a conversation and ask those, start asking those hard questions about um, race and having very open, honest conversations. I mean, I've had the pleasure of um, both Dr. Ebong and Dr. Egadoro, both were my medical students, and now I 
am so pleased that Dr. Ebong is one of my colleagues and Dr. Agadoro, I know is gonna do humongous things in neurology. I just can't wait to see her soar. Uh, I have to say what my, my chair says to me, it's, it's really fun to watch um, your students, you know, start to soar. So, you know, I realized as a white woman that I have a lot of uh, learning to do. And I actually had the pleasure that they're both my students, but they've taught me and let me um, ask some hard questions and, you know, you know, things that I don't like to, to talk about your work and, um, and what you're doing currently at the University of Kentucky? Sure. Um, so thank you again for the wonderful introduction and thank you for uh, allowing me to have this platform this evening. So a few things that I'm doing at the University of Kentucky as um, Dr. Hester, Dr. Hester, are we, we, we're doing first names, right? This is a yes, conversation. Let's do, let's, do okay. first names. let's do first names. So as Amy has stated, I'm the Director of Diversity and Inclusion for the Department of, the, of Neurology. Um, and it's a position that I, I founded uh, just a year ago. And even before this period of awakening that's happening in the country, um, to go back to my work in this area of diversity and inclusion as a medical student um, at the University of Kentucky over 10 years ago, I founded a program that was designed to recruit um, students who are underrepresented in medicine. So um, undergraduate students, post-baccalaureate students, students who were pre-medicine who are interested in coming to medical school to recruit them to UK. And actually, Essie was in the first group of those students. So she's actually the best example of what a pipeline program should be, that we get these students early on in their career, attract them to the College of Medicine, help them grow and matriculate through the college and become physicians. So that program is it's in its 10th year, and I'm very proud of that program. Even though I left and did residency, I still wasn't in touch with UK because I knew I wanted to come back. And now that I'm back, I'm also the um, advisor for the same program. So I helped them out. And this year with COVID, the program looked a little different. It was all online, just like everything else is virtual, but it was a successful program for our uh, underrepresented students this year. And it will continue as long as the College of Medicine continues to support it. But now in terms of neurology, as the Director of Diversity and Inclusion, we have many different projects along the lines of diversity and inclusion. When people hear diversity and inclusion, I know a lot of times they first think about race and ethnicity, but, we talk, but our goals are to improve um, environments for all people who are considered quote unquote minoritized, so LGBTQI, um, racial minorities, ethnic minorities, gender minorities, um, so one of our goals is to recruit and retain and also make sure that all people are advanced in the field of neurology uh, from residents all the way up to full professors. We wanna make sure also that we have staff that represents everyone. So we are working on, um, we're working with our staff to make sure that we're hiring people that look like our patient population and population of the US in general. And other things we're concerned about is um, equity and equality for all of our patients. So again, we have so many things in the pipeline as we talk, as we get into the conversation, a lot of these things will come out, but I just wanted to give a brief overview of some of the work that we're doing um, in our department. Great. And Essie, can you talk about why you got interested in healthcare disparities and what you've kind of done along with your PhD and what you're continuing to do? Yes, sure, of course. So when I was in my second year in graduate school, we have to do what we call a qualifying exam, which means you have to prepare a project for your committee of five or six different scientists and professors, and then propose to them, this is the work that you want to do for the rest of your PhD dissertation. So I worked in the Alzheimer's Disease Center where, you know, we were studying um, different um, correlations and pathologies that lead to dementia in the elderly population. So in that, in that data set, there was numerous variables, including race. 
So when I propose, okay, I want to study the different variables that impact cognition. One of my variables was race. And I said, okay, I want to study this. I want to use this variable, including race. I had one um, professor, Dr. Nita Fernander, who's a behavioral scientist and practically changed the way I look at race and racism. She asked me, why do you want to use race as a variable? And it really threw me off guard. I didn't know how to answer. I'm just like, because that's what has been done in the past and that's what I've seen published. And she really challenged me in that, what is race? What is racism? You know, why is it that, you know, we're studying race? How do we social of that in a turn to where I'm now like focusing on race, racism, discrimination, and how that plays a role in medicine, how we can better improve our research so that we're not perpetuating this idea of biological determinization. So that's, that's where, that's how I got started on, um, on studying race and racism in neurology. I know we actually just had a book club and some of the people on this call might have been part of our book club. And Ema, you had brought up a book of um, medical apartheid, which, you know, I wasn't aware of this book. I mean, it was a really hard book to get through because it's kind of, a, I mean, I think, you know, some of us have heard about Tuskegee trials and the syphilis and black men, but, you know, there's so much more. Don't you think, Ema, there's so much more that we don't know about, you know, the history of medicine, I think it's important for us to know as doctors. It's important for us to know so we don't repeat those atrocities. I think it's a failure of medical education, the fact that many of us on, on the, during the book club, some of us who proudly proclaim they've been out of medical school since the 60s and 70s and they had no idea, some of us stated that the medical schools that we attended were cited in the book as having committed some of the atrocities, such as um, robbing graves, the graves of slaves and, and, and Black people to use the um, corpses for anatomy labs. Like, well, I remember one of our um, WNG uh, participants doing the book, book club said she went to University of South Carolina, MUSC, which is the university now, the name of the university now, but you know historically, it, I forgot the name of it, I think it was just University of South Carolina, or call it Medical College of, of South Carolina. But she said she never learned any of that while she was in medical school. And even us in Kentucky, in medical school as a first year and second year, when we learned about the history of medicine in um, our classes in Kentucky, we rever Ephraim McDowell. And it wasn't until I read that book that I learned how, what a horrible person he was and all the experimentation he did on his slaves here in the state of Kentucky to perfect his surgical techniques. Yet on our epilepsy monitoring unit floor, which is the seventh floor of our hospital, I walked past a painting of his original hospital every single day. I had no idea about Ephraim McDowell. And not only that, we all know in the state of Kentucky, we have three medical schools currently now, University of Kentucky, University of Louisville, and also um, the, uh, the medical college in, in Pikeville. And I didn't realize until after this book that one of the oldest uh, medical universities or medical schools in the US was at Transylvania, which is still a undergraduate college here in Kentucky, but there was a Transylvania medical school that predates all of the medical schools in Kentucky. And that school, again, committed so many atrocities um, against black people. So I think it was an eye-opening experience to read that and share that with one another. I also think that it shows that many of these things just weren't centuries ago. They talked about many things that happened most recently in the late 20th century. And we even see some things now in recent news with, um, with detainees in, in, in an Atlanta ICE facility where there's being an investigation as to forced sterilization. And we, the book talked about what's called quote unquote Mississippi appendectomies where black women were unbeknownst to them without informed consent would undergo hysterectomies without being, without knowing. And one of the most famous victims of that is Fannie Lou Hamer, who was a famous civil rights activist. So we learned so much through the, that book. And I think it was important for us as women 
first of all, as women to know these things happen to all of us. And if we're a women in neurology group, we have to fight for all women, um, not just some women. And I think this, the history in this country showed that many times the fight for women was just one group of women, namely white women, which is a fact. And I think that moving forward, we're going to have to take the lead in a lot of these things because we see that the people who were, I want to say chosen to lead medicine in the, in the past, who were typically men, they did terrible jobs. Everything's come into light and nobody's afraid to, well, a lot of people aren't afraid to speak up anymore. I think myself and Essie are proof that we're going to make sure that we are all educated and we're going to speak up against these things so they don't happen again. And I remember it was Dr. Anita Fernander who introduced me to that book and I was reading it as a second year graduate student. And it, I remember crying as I read through that book. And I remember sitting in my, my research lab, just tears were pouring down and I, and it was really hard for me to read through that book as a, as a black person, you know, in medicine and just knowing that the foundation of medicine, some of the simplest tools that have changed how we practice medicine were founded and built in such horrific experiments that would never get through IRB approval today. And as you mentioned, we, we revere some of these physicians and scientists and we're not taught this. And now that we know, because we chose to read through these books and publish papers in this area, what do we do and how do we, how do we move forward knowing that our history and medicine is a, you know, there are horrific things that have happened and how do we move past that and you know make it better for individuals of color so it, it's i'm still, still something i'm trying to process and i think i'm processing it by devoting my career to health disparities and publishing and educating the next generation of physicians and scientists that you know what we've been taught always question what we've been taught why why is it that african americans have higher rates of um quote unquote sickle cell disease or stroke or dementia, you know, is it really genetics or is, is there something deeper inherent to society that's predisposing people of color to these um, comorbidities? And then how can we change that? So it, it, it changed my mindset completely. And I think it's a really important book and I, and I commend, you know, Dr. or Ema is the uh, you know, in our medical school is, I mean, if we don't know about these things, I mean, yes, I had heard about Tuskegee. My husband's a physician. He didn't even, he, he wasn't even aware of Tuskegee when I brought it up to, you know, brought it up to him. But I mean, I think if we, if we don't know these things, I actually, I think in our book group, I, I did the book on Audible and I actually was glad somebody else was reading it to me because it was so horrific. I felt like at least I had somebody like there to commiserate with, but I think it's a really important book if you haven't if you don't know that book i think it's just really an important book to know so we can't we're not going to go and repeat these atrocities as essie was saying so you know and essie and ema and i had had a conversation about you know in some of the phrases and you know i remember hearing this phrase and actually i've you know hearing the phrase i don't see color and as a white woman I felt like I was, I don't see color, so therefore I think of everyone as equal. And it was really interesting, actually, I want, uh, I can see the hair on, on both of the back of their necks kind of raising because, you know, they look at it very differently than I did. I thought I was being like, you know, inclusive of everybody and actually one of my colleagues, but, you know, it's, you know, I think it's not what I learned from both Ema and Essie is it's not acknowledging that we have different experiences. And so, Ema, do you want to, do you want to take, you know, do you want to respond to, I don't see color? Yeah. So I remember the first time we, we talked about this. And the first thing I said that when you say that, you're saying that I don't see you, I don't appreciate you. And I don't appreciate all the background heritage and culture that makes you who you are. And I think when people say I don't see color it comes from a place of privilege because, you know, history, we know how history is written in this country. History was essentially written by the people who were the leaders in this country for centuries, white men. So if you say, oh, I don't see color, you're not allowing people who have been oppressed or stifled to have a voice, to hear their story. 
And then not, not only that, I feel that many people who say they don't see color, that's a way for them to get away from the conversation. They don't want to have the difficult um, conversations about race and racism. So it's almost like they're telling you, oh, oh, shut up, we're beyond that. There's no color anymore. We're all the same. And one of the reasons I think this country hasn't moved forward um, over the last 400 years is because, in all honesty, we haven't had difficult conversations about race and racism. There's so many people, um, for instance, colleagues of ours, people we probably went to school with, especially a person like me who went to a predominantly white school pretty much all of my adult life. It's so, I feel it's so easy for certain people to say that they don't see color if all they grew up in was a white neighborhood who had white friends who did not have um, deep friendships or very close friendships with people of other races who they go to their white church. They're in their white bubble all the time. So it's easy for them to say that, oh, I don't, you know, I, I don't see color because literally you don't see color. You don't see anyone else. When you're confronted with the fact that there are people who are different with, from you and who needs, whose stories need to be heard, if you just brush them off or don't recognize that, hey, they do have a story, they do have a history. It, like I said, it comes off from a place of privilege. And I think the more that people understand that, the easier it would be to have these conversations without being offended or being afraid or, or, or being defensive. Because a lot of times we have these hard conversations and certain people are on the defense. We just need to talk it out. Just talk about it. Remember, Martin Luther King said he had a dream. That dream was not a reality. It's still not a reality. In the future, we might come to that point where we could say that. But until I think this country, we work out all of the differences and work out what's happened in the past and come to a realization that, hey, these things have happened to this certain group of people and, and they're still recovering from it, then we'll still be stuck in this place for the next 100 years, 200 years. And, I, and actually, I think Ema in our conversation that the three of us had, you know, you had said, you know, why well, do? Because my my fourth grader is studying about Greek gods, and all of them are white. But and I was like, I've never thought about gods not being white. But there's, you know, there's all these other cultures that have their, you know, gods and whatnot. But what are children taught about? You know, I have my older one was Poseidon, and now I have, you know, you know mother Greek god. But I hadn't thought about these things. So you know, I think that it's important for us. You know, and one question that I ask, so Essie, would you like to actually, you know, as far as another phrase that's commonly used is, you know, I believe all lives matter. Yeah, I, I to me, it, it shuts down a conversation, you know, because when you say that you're basically downplaying the struggles and the lived experience of black people. And when, you know, when I come to you and tell you my experiences and you say, well, all lives matter, so then, then that, it just, it minimizes my lived experience and we can't have a conversation. And if we have that mindset as a society, then black individuals will continue to be oppressed and um, you know, be, not be able to thrive in this society. So I think, yes, all lives matter, but right now, and I think Ema, when we talked about this earlier, used a phenomenal metaphor not, you know, let you use the metaphor that you used to explain it, but it really put it in perspective so that when people do tell me all lives matter, I could, you know, use the same metaphors that Ema discussed earlier. Ema, if you want to share the metaphors you used. Yeah, and I'm not going to take credit for this metaphor, but, <laughs> it's, but I've been seeing and I've been using it because it makes so much sense. So one of the metaphors is about animals. Many people understand animal rights, okay? common animals that are extinct are things like whales. So when people say, save the whales, we're not saying, oh, well, what about the sharks? What about the guppies? What about the uh, goldfish? We understand that yes, all the fish are important, but right now the whales are on the verge of extinction or having some problems, okay? So we're gonna focus on the whales. Another example that I've seen published widely is this cartoon of a house burning in a neighborhood. 
and you can see the owner of the house with a hose trying to extinguish the fire. Then his neighbor comes to him and says, well, what about my house? Well, my house is burning right now. My house is on the verge of burning down. I'm not going to have anywhere to live. Yes, your house is important, but at this very moment, I need to fix this house. So it seems that when you use inanimate objects or animals, like I said, I, I don't know, I'm from the Bahamas. We love animals too. But I think here, when you talk about animals, people's ears perk up a lot more. <laughs> so when you say that, I've had, I've had people react like, oh, okay, that, that makes sense. Um, but again, I've seen this floating all around. And so I share it. As soon as I've, I've had people say this to me, colleagues and friends, you know, they really want to know why is all lives matter? Uh, why does all lives matter? matter uh, or the statement, why is it problematic? And that's the reason why it's problematic. All lives cannot matter until Black lives matter. Which I think is a great statement. So, you know, Essie, we were talking about you're in a different role and that you're a neurology resident and wisely made that choice. <laughs> <laughs> I always like to I'm laughing <laughs> because I'm laughing because Essie was one of these in, who sat in my office and she goes, well, I like internal medicine, but I really love neurology. And I was like, okay, so you're talking all about neurology, Essie. So what do you think you should specialize in? So obviously she made the wise choice. I know we, I hope I'm not offending. I know we have other people besides WNG on here, but she made the wise choice. But what is it like as a resident? And I think this is important for all of us at the resident level up to full professor level and even, you know, community physicians to practice as a black physician it's in, the, in the time of with this, you know, this going on with Black Lives Matter. It's been extremely difficult because some of the situations that I've been on with patients it's, I can't bring it to the attention of my colleagues in fear that they may not understand where I'm coming from. And you know, some of the situations I've been in include patients and their loved ones that would wear, you know, blue lives matter or all lives matter. Or when I go into the room thinking that I made a really strong connection with the patient, then, I, then another physician goes who is a white physician. And then that patient is telling this white physician, hey, you know, calling me racial slurs behind my back you know, and I'm like, where is this coming from? Um, one example that I could give is I had a patient, a patient's family member came, come, came in to come see me initially for a visit, then they came back for a follow-up, and this family member knew that I'm a person of color, came back into the hospital, wore a um, Blue Lives Matter shirt, and this was right after George was killed, you know, in Minneapolis, and it really, it, it really took me off guard because I thought I had made this connection with this family. I thought we were all on the same page and you know, we were good, but then he comes in with this shirt and it's just like a big smack in my face. And it tells me that in my opinion, you have no regard for, for me or for people like me, you know, when it comes to police brutality. And so in that moment for at least five minutes, you know, the patient was talking to me, tell me her um, issues and I completely just blanked out. Cause I'm like, okay, so now what do I do? Do I sit here? In, in this uncomfort and, you know, try and um, help the patient the best I can. Do I excuse myself for five minutes? Do I go talk to my attending to say, hey, here's what's going on? You know, what do you recommend? Or do I just push through it? And many times I've been pushing through it. And that's just one small example. But there are other more gross examples of microaggressions, microaggressions, and I just continue to keep pushing through it. And it's, you know, getting very exhausting. And you know, after that incident, I, I brought it up with my program director who was extremely supportive and very nurturing and said, I'm sorry that this happened to you. And, you know, I hope that you feel that you could reach out to anyone and, you know, express your concerns of when these issues do arise so that we can address it head on. And I was honest with them. And I said, in my experience, not everyone understands where I'm coming from. And I don't want to have to, you know, in my time of, you know, just, utter, you know, disbelief, have to explain to someone why that hurt me so much. So many issues like that have happened. And, you know, I think a handful of the, my colleagues are talking to who are of color, we just keep pushing through it. 
in hopes that maybe one day it'll get better. But it is another added barrier to, you know, not never being called a doctor, um, you know, having to go through these micro microaggressions on a day to day basis, having to prove myself imposter syndrome. And then on top of that, having to be the phenomenal doctor that I need to be to get through the curriculum. So I guess to summarize, to answer your question, it's, it's extremely difficult. It really is. And Ima, have you had, well, you know, what's been your response kind of at a different level than Essie, you know, a few years ahead, but she'll be there with us soon enough. But have you had similar uh, experiences? Yeah, dating back uh, as a med student, and it, I still see this clearly as a third year medical school on my surgery rotation, I had a patient call me the end when I walked into the room and I was traumatized at the moment and at the time it happened my it was with the team I was with my the resident and the senior resident and the junior resident asked me to step out and I said like when she stepped on me I said no this is I'm here to be educated I'm paying for this I don't want to leave and so right after that I went back home and I wrote an email to administration college of medicine the dean of the um at the time, um, he, he, he's now one of the senior deans, but he was one of the deans for um, student affairs. And I sent an email to like the vice um, president of the university for diversity at the time. I just emailed everyone because I'm like, I'm not keeping this to myself. So I remember having to meet with all these people and to discuss the case. I had to give my, the name of the patient. And they did an investigation. Um, but my point is I didn't stay quiet because even then, this was back in about 2011, I was third year, I started third year and it was early on in the year. And I said, I'm not keeping this quiet because I'm at the point, I don't know what, I had a moment of clarity and I figured I wasn't the only person who had gone through this, but I wanted to make sure that other people knew this was going on. Um, so now fast forward to just a few months ago on Twitter, there was a hashtag black in the ivory and I don't know if um, many of you on this um, on this um, platform have been looking at Black in the Ivory hashtag Black in the Ivory, and I'll and I'll type it in there. But Black physicians, Black college professors, Black academics have been posting their personal stories for the last few months, and it's astounding to me that how so many people say, "Wow, we didn't know this was going on," and. I was saying to myself, you didn't know what was going on because you're just in your bubble. And a lot of times, perhaps people like us were afraid to say anything because if you say something, then your career is stifled. Somebody is gonna shut you up and you're not going to be promoted because you said something. But some of the stories are, I mean, just mind blowing. Other people have been called, when I posted on my, my story on Black and the Ivory as a tweet, so many people said that happened to me, other medical students, other physicians, and these are people my age, so this is recent, these aren't physicians who are like 80, 90 years old and talking about their experience in the civil rights era, this, this is current, and so it's still happening. Um, fortunately, as an attending, I haven't had anything like that happen to me, but I've walked into rooms and talked to patients, introduced myself as Dr. Ebong, have on my white coat, Dr. Ebong, talk, talk about the plan, and patients would ask me, so when am I going to see the doctor? I am, <laughs> I am your doctor, we established that. And then I have code words like, wow, I didn't expect to see you, or you look so young to be a doctor, and in my head, I'm like, do I look so black to be a doctor? Because I don't think I'm that young, I have some grades. <laughs> But, you know, I, you hear these things and, uh, and Essie brought up imposter syndrome. So, you, uh, so you're like, okay, is this happening because they don't expect something from me? They don't expect me to be intelligent. They don't think that I'm going to be able to treat them. Um, I've had experiences lately with the Blue Lives Matter pins. I've had a patient wear a MAGA hat to clinic. And when I walked in, he took it off and put it down. I don't know if it was a, a a scare tactic, but I just went on. I didn't bring draw attention to it. I just went on. But every time I see those hats, I honestly ask myself, do these people can, if I were to ask somebody, when was America great again? Like, tell me the era. What would they tell me as a black woman? Because 
last week or week before, I think it was last week when there was the, um, the presidential town hall, someone did ask our president, when, when was this country great for black people? And honestly, he couldn't answer it. So I know that there's some coded language behind MAGA and giving some people the benefit of the doubt, maybe they don't know, maybe they're really ignorant, but if they are, they're willfully ignorant. And I do think that when people come to a clinic and they see um, a physician of color, a black person or a, a Hispanic person or any underrepresented person, they might try to intimidate them. And I do really think that some of those things are scare tactics. Um, that's just my opinion. <laughs> And I think even, I know originally, you know, at, with, with some of my colleagues and some of my attendings, when I've received feedback, you know, some of the comments that I was like, you know, where is this coming from? And I, you know, I can take criticism. I, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not a stranger to criticism, but some comments that I've, that have, that I've heard that I'm like, I, I think that's, I don't know where that's coming from. For example, you know, you you speak very loudly. You know, I think you should you know tone your voice down. Or one um, feedback I got was, you're very overconfident. You should you know you should take that down a notch. And it's like if I was a white man, would you tell me those exact same okay. feedback? So it's I I don't think it's just from the patient um, doctor interaction. I think it's also unfortunately with with colleagues as well. And you know what can we? And I think having these conversations and you know, having platforms where we can talk about these experiences will help to hopefully eliminate, you know, these situations in the future. And then actually we have a question, Nasha had asked a question about, and I guess Essie probably more towards you, how can we support trainees when they meet with aggressive statements and unacceptable behaviors, particularly when we as the attendings are in the role of authority? And I've seen it happen, just the microaggressions to somebody who is Middle Eastern and, you know, patients asking, like, where are you from? And, the, you know, the, student, the resident goes, Detroit? He goes, no, where are you really from? I mean, you know, that kind of, you know, but what can we do as attendings? I think, and I've had phenomenal attendings do this. Recently, I had um, a patient that I was, you know, I was the main resident for the patient. He didn't, he still couldn't, he didn't know to call me doctor, but he would call my other male colleagues doctors. And then so the physician, when we walked in, my attending picked up on that and he said, no, this is Dr. Igor Dower. She is a physician, you know, she's the main person taking care of you, like reinforcing, you know, this, like trying to negate some of these micro macro aggressions. Another example, you know, I had a patient that said, that was using a lot of, um, sexist terms you know he would call me honey or dear or sweetie but would call my male colleagues doctor and when the attending picked up on this he would say you know he just said it in front of everybody doing rounds and i really respected and appreciated that he said we don't use these terms these terms are derogatory toward women you call her doctor and i what and i started i almost started crying because i felt like he lifted the load off of me i didn't have to have this struggle by myself. There are people around me who were supporting me and helping me, you know, with, with these experiences. So I think as attendings, when you notice these events, I would just, you know, speak up right then and there because it really does um, help the resident and it sets the tone for the, for the rest of the interaction. I also want to add that I think it's important if you're if you're in an academic institution and your university has an adopted policies that address that, um, address these issues, meaning issues regarding patients, racism, sexism, bigotry, or abuse toward physicians or any medical staff, that you look into that and make sure that happens. So at University of Kentucky, we have policies in writing that um, are enforced. So if it's found out that a patient was racist or requested a change of position because of racist, sexist, um, any bigoted um, beliefs, then um, it is escalated and those patients could be fired from the practice. Um, so I definitely think that if you're not sure if your um, institution, whether it's um, private or academic based has, has that, you look into that tomorrow 
um, because that can't be supported. And we also have similar policy regarding peer-to-peer -peer, because now we're talking a lot about patients' interactions with us, but you have to remember their peer-to-peer -peer physician interactions as well, um, where um, there might be incidences regarding race, sexism, gender bias. All of these things are, are, are real, a reality in our field. And we also adopted language um, against that or language that will penalize someone if they do act in those manners. So I do recommend you just following up with your institution and finding out if there are policies. And if not, then you can be the one to make change, like advocate for something to be written um, and set in stone so that these things don't happen. Oh, so, I, Ema, there was a question in the chat. Oops, mm -hmm. oops, sorry. There's a question in the chat of where should we look to find information, especially in large academic centers, when there's so many players in creating policy? Where do you even start, I guess? So that's an excellent question. Um, so I would start, if you have um, an institutional diversity team, whether or not, if it's in a large um, academic center, you can start main campus. So at University of Kentucky, we have under the president, the, um, the Office of Institutional Diversity, and there's a vice president of institutional diversity. And then under that, all of the colleges would have their deans of diversity and inclusion. And in the College of Medicine, we have a dean of diversity and inclusion who um, falls under that hierarchy. And then people like me who are the directors of diversity and inclusion or diversity offices of the department, we, uh, we you know, meet with her and answer uh, to her regarding all things diversity and inclusion. So a lot of these policies come out of a diversity and inclusion office. So you need to just inquire about that office first, um, either in the academic center. Or I, I do think most academic centers nowadays have that. And if that's not there, talk directly to the dean of your school of medicine, college of medicine. If you're in a hospital, talk to the CMO of the hospital. There is someone who can make those changes and maybe you just have to be the person to inquire about it and get people talking. So there was another comment. Um, uh, by Dr. Daly, I can think of times when I got unequal treatment as a woman or because I look so young. And actually, when both of you were speaking, I felt the same way. I can only imagine that multiplied by affinity if add race and eth uh, ethnicity to the equation. It seems to be hard for humans to imagine experiences different from their own. Why is it so hard to, yeah, so hard to get people to imagine the experience of others and how can we help it along? Oh, she then said she didn't look young anymore. I'm sure you still look young, Dr. Daly. So, I mean, that's, I mean, it's a good point. I actually, as she, as you all were talking, I had the same thought because oftentimes just being a female, you know, I have these like six to six, four medical students who are behind me and, you know, patients or their families look at them and they say, so doctor, what are we going to do for, you know, my loved one? And, uh, you know, it's, and they look to the males, you know, just because of the, you know, because, you know, males are, doc you know, males are doctors and females are the nurses. And so add in the, you know, I agree with what Dr. Daly was saying, you know, add in, you know, race and that adds another layer of complexity. I think what one thing, and I think this is why I started really trying to, um, with Ema's strong encouragement, get on social media is to be visible. Because when, I guess, when people think of doctors, they don't think of people that look like me. So I'm like, okay, well, I, I'm here, I'm exist. Let me start, you know, promoting myself on social media so that when you go to a doctor's office, you know, you are used to seeing people of different walks of life, race, creeds, gender, sexual orientation, so that we're not continuing to have these interactions and these micro microaggressions in the hospital setting. So I think one thing that we could do and we could, you know, do now is being more, and we are doing being more vocal and more um, accessible on social media so that, you know, the, the young kids, because for me, my, my heart is really in like mentoring young, young individuals and letting them know that, hey, you can be whatever you want to be. I'm here, I'm doing it, your skin color, your, 
gender doesn't limit you as to what you can do. And I think by, you know, putting ourselves out there, people can reach out to us, we're tangible, and we can help diversify the field of medicine and neurology. And, and, and that's really a good segue, mentorship, because I think, um, again, the title of this talk is, you know, bring it, the conversation of diversity. And we know that our field is definitely one of the least diverse in medicine regarding both race and, and gender. So the last um, AAN statistics that we had from the 2018 um, data showed that um, there are about 2.7% of neurologists were Black or African Americans. Compare that to 13.5% of the U.S. population. And mm -hmm. with Hispanic or Latino uh, neurologists, um, make up about 5 to 7% and 18% uh, of the population. So definitely a huge disparity between um, neurologists who are under who are underrepresented neurologists and those in the general population. And mentorship is the key. Uh, I I, uh, you all, some of you on here might know I'm a big proponent of social media and this is actually kind of new to me. I only really came on last year and it was because of the diversity leadership co um, program. Shameless plug for any leadership program through AAN, apply for it. That's all I'll say <laughs> about that. But it gave me the confidence um, to go on to, to use that as a platform to show that, hey, there are not only physicians, but neurologists, you can do this. And we do know that in general, many medical students go, don't go into the field and ranging from excuses such as, oh, it might be too hard. But really what I hear from most people is they, they never knew that there were black neurologists or neurologists that look like them. So mentorship is the key to improving diversity within neurology. Um, so at UK through, um, the, uh, through my position as Director of Diversity and Inclusion, we're starting mentorship pro um, programs, pipelines, targeting right now college students, but eventually we're gonna open it up to those in middle school, high school, have these pipeline programs to guide these future neurologists from underrepresented backgrounds. I'm very proud of that. Similar to the way we have UK Med, but this will be strictly for neurology. And the program is longitudinal in the sense that they'll be paired with a mentor and given a project, either a clinical research project or a neuroscience project, just to get the wheels turning in their head. Like, yes, I want to be a neurologist. I'm going to be a neurologist. I will be a neurologist. And I think that's where it starts. You need to see people who look like you. Now, in all reality, we know that there aren't enough Black and Latino neurologists or even physicians to mentor everyone so you can be a mentor anyone can be a mentor as long as you have that passion and as long as you're able to guide these students to where they need to be at the next level you can be a mentor you don't have to be underrepresented to be a mentor and you know you make a great point because you know i used to think okay i have to be a full professor before i can be a mentor but I realized I could start being a mentor now and some of my mentees are on. Thank you guys for, for being on, you know, with, I can mentor people and in, in research or help people who are interested in neurology, you know, um, practice their interviews because right now it's interview season. So you, you can be a mentor at the student, the medical student level, the college level, high school level and beyond. You, you don't have to wait until you're, you know, set in your career before you can mentor. So I really encourage and, you know, people who have that, Part to start mentoring today. That's one thing that we could all do to help diversify the field of neurology. I think that that's really important. And what what I think that what Ema and Essie are sharing is it starts individually and having these conversations. But actually, Ema, I was hoping that you could. I know we're getting a little close on time here, but you were put on the and the special commission. I think it was out of your work in the diversity leadership, the special commission on racism and inequity and social justice. Can you just talk, I know we can't talk about the specifics because it's not been completely approved by the board of directors, but what was the charge that was given to this group of individuals that was brought together? It was just this summer. Yeah, so I was, honored to be chosen to be part of the commission. So the charge was to create an organization really revamping AAN to be an actively anti-racist organization um, that, uh, and, and also an organization that really addresses healthcare disparities 
um, amongst all people with neurological diseases in particular. So it was somewhere twofold. Um, and like you said, you know, I can't go into much detail, but I can tell you the process was a very enlightening one. Um, there were 20 of us that were uh, chosen. Most of us were committee chairs or even executive board members of the AAN. But people like me, I guess because I've been so vocal about it, was chosen as a member of lar at large um, to give honest opinions. And we had these difficult conversations once a week, two hours, two hours a week amongst ourselves on how to improve AAN. And I remember that first conversation, we were given this uh, rubric that rates any organ, any generic organization on how anti-racist they are from a score of zero, meaning like completely racist to six being anti-racist. So they asked us, you know, how would we rate AAN? And many of us who are younger, um, of color, women, other minority people who might not be underrepresented, but um, like say Asians or Middle Eastern uh, people, they rated AAN as a two. And it was eye opening for some of the older white men on the commission who rated it as like a five or six. And from day one, it was like, okay, we have our work to do. And we had to have those difficult conversations. So the people who have been in AAN for so long who didn't see that there was a problem, they had to listen and hear the stories and hear. I mean, I remember certain people were saying how they were the first um, board, I don't wanna say which, which, which uh, member of the board, but they were the first Asian board member. And this was just in recent years. Or this person saying like, they were the first black woman to do this. And again, this is recent years. Um, other things that people didn't realize that if you go to AAN meetings, the speakers, most of the speakers are all white men. Okay. Yeah, and for some reason, people weren't seeing that. Or they, um, not just speakers in the sessions, but even the big plenary sessions, they pretty much all looked alike. So we had these hard conversations where it felt like our, our voices were being heard. And it was in a protected space because we knew we were all there to, um, to get the mission and to, to, you know, to answer the charge, to answer the charge of the commission. So we were able to speak freely because we knew the only way to answer the question is if everyone was open and honest. And then also if people listen to each other, to hear each other's perspectives. So again, we did this for about six weeks and intense conversations, intense emails back and forth. But at the end of the day, we came up with a document that we're extremely proud of. And like you said, it's just being, uh, we're awaiting approval from the executive board. But um, like I said, brings back to the beginning of this conversation. We have to have those conversations. And in a way, I'm glad that um, AN did um, choose to have the commission. A little backstory, and I'm not sure if the commission is brought out of this, but it's along the timeline. So if you all remember, after George Floyd was murdered, and he was murdered in Minneapolis, where the headquarters for AAN is located, AAN put out an initial statement. It, it wasn't a very forthright statement condemning racism and police brutality. It really talks about, yeah, we're all safe in Minneapolis. The building is safe. And I was very upset by the first statement because I'm, I said, the AN is not the building. Who cares about the building? The building could be rebuilt if something happened. The AN is, is us. We're, we consist of white men, white women, black women, Asian women, Hispanic women, Hispanic women, everyone. We have doctors of all races, ethnicities, creeds, um, genders. And you're worried about the building? No. How, let's address the bigger picture. And that's what's bubbling under in this country. So I had spoken to some people and fortunately, I wasn't the only one. Many people thought just like I did. And we all spoke to people 
I guess, individually. And sure enough, a strong statement came out. And that's the true statement. And because of that, I think that the leadership said that, hey, let's fix this because clearly there's something wrong. And I'm so proud of the AAN for just taking the lead and taking the stance when they did because the only place to go now is forward. I actually had the opportunity on equity and diversity and inclusion, um, the council that I sit on and seeing this document and, and they and the special commission has put through put across some really challenging, you know, and some very radical changes. And I think it's going to like really shake up our, uh, you know, the AN as an organization. So, you know, I guess we, we're getting close to I'm watching the time here. I think we're past the time. Um, so any final share with everyone how do we move forward how what how do you charge uh, those of us who you know those of us who are white that have had different experiences than you how do we move forward i think by having conversations like this is where we start and i'm just very honored and humbled that the woman in neurology group is having these kind of conversations and thank you for having me on and continue to having these conversations where we all come to the table with a common goal and just listening and trying to improve medicine, you know, improve medicine and improve the environment for, for people of color. So I think just being open, being vulnerable and seeing how you can help is where, where I would recommend starting. And then Ema, any last thoughts? Thank you, Essie. Yeah, I mean, I have to agree, just continue to have these they're difficult conversations, but you know what? Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. We have to do it. We have to continue the conversations and we have to continue the work. And always remember to, even though your colleagues might be, they might not be saying anything, uh, just think about what they may be going through during this time because we see so many things on the news and we, you know, many of us internalize that we think this could be our husband, this could be our sister, our brothers could be, could be us. So just consider all those things too. Again, we put on a face, our, we're superheroes are treating these patients, but you know, day in and day out, we're still dealing with all of these things that are going on. And this is a reality for many people in this country. And besides being making us better doctors, we want to raise better children to understand the world around them. That's my goal. I want, you know, to raise better children in our personal lives, as well as taking better care of patients. And so with that, I think um, we've had some nice comments in our chat. I don't see any other questions. Monica, do you see any other questions? There's lots of thank you. Thank you for all of you from joining us and taking an hour out of your evening to join us. This has been fun and, you know, I hope that you, you all in your workplace and with your communities have these difficult conversations and I'm grateful for both Ema and Esty as part of my life so I can ask my uncomfortable questions and, you know, it you know, makes for an uncomfortable, but that's how we get comfortable by asking uncomfortable questions. So thanks everyone and have a great night. Good night. Thank you.